and it all has come to this. Episode 100 of Zylog and Moto. If you had told me not quite two years ago that I'd still be doing a weekly 20-minute YouTube show about the 8- and 16-bit world of Sega consoles and the games on them, I'd be pretty impressed. And I'm proud of the fact that I'm still doing this two years in for myself and my 86 subscribers out there. And by the way, thank all of you for subscribing. It, it really means a lot. I'm not sure why other people get into doing a YouTube channel. I'm sure maybe some of it see a way of finding notoriety or potentially having a nice second income stream. Me, I, I just like sharing my hobby out there with all of you and hopefully providing some value or entertainment to your daily lives. I could do this for the next 20 years and I'm going to have to to reach my goal of collecting and reviewing all these games. And if I still just had those same 86 subscribers that decided that my ideas were intriguing to them and that they'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, I'd be fine with that. There's a lot of people out there on the internet that produce great retro gaming content, and I'd just like to be able to say that I'm one of them, no matter how many views these videos may or may not get. Having said all that, now I'm going to do a bit of a 180. After seeing recently some posts by some people I really respect on Twitter, I've decided to change a long-standing policy I've had, and I figured the 100th episode was a good time to make that change. I'm going to start briefly asking people to subscribe at the top and bottom of each review going forward. Why? Well, unfortunately, it's the cold reality of YouTube and the almighty algorithm. Retro gaming is already a bit of a niche subject, and even more so since I'm concentrating on Sega instead of ugh, Nintendo. So it's really hard to get eyeballs on some of these videos without that subscriber help, making YouTube think someone actually wants to watch these videos. Crazy thought, I know. So hopefully none of you viewers will think this is too obtrusive. And again, I want to stress that that's not ego talking. That's just a desire to get the word out there. So anyway, enough about all that in this overlong intro. Let's get to the star of episode 100. And you might as well say the star of the entire 8 and 16 bit era of Sega, which is the heart of this channel. Specifically, I'm talking about the game that changed everything in 1991, and I do mean everything. Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. What is there to say about Sonic that hasn't been said ad nauseum and probably better than I could over the last 30 years? 30 years? Holy shit, I'm old. I mean, this is a game that kickstarted a console revolution and allowed Sega to successfully hold the line against Nintendo despite the Super Nintendo debut viewing two months later in the United States with one of the greatest games of all time in Super Mario World. See, I can say nice things about Nintendo, I just choose not to. And while later games in the Sonic series haven't exactly had the best reputation, it hasn't mattered, and Sonic has still maintained its status as a cultural icon, even getting a major motion picture release last year that was far, far better than I think anyone expected, and definitely a better than certain other movie-based film yeah, that was the look on my face when I saw it in the theaters too, John. What can add to this conversation about Sonic the Hedgehog? Well, maybe my personal story about my history with the game. Growing up, my family didn't have a lot. We got by, but with my dad in retail and my mom a librarian, there wasn't exactly a ton of money coming into the door. There wasn't a VCR or a microwave in the house until they were given to us by friends who had upgraded theirs and didn't need their old ones anymore. When everyone else was enjoying the NES and the Master System, I was still playing with an Atari 2600 Junior and a shoebox of hand-me-down video games. My uncle, who worked in Electronics Boutique at the time, let me borrow his Genesis at one point, when things were particularly difficult, and my parents saw how much I enjoyed it. So, that Christmas, my parents made the sacrifice and got me the Genesis with its newly changed packing game of Sonic the Hedgehog. And I played the crap out of it. In fact, getting that Genesis right then with Sonic the Hedgehog rather than Altered Beast is probably a large part of why I'm doing this channel today. For the younger viewers out there that somehow have never played the original Sonic the Hedgehog, and seriously, if that's the case, just pause now and go take care of that. It's been ported to everything. Sonic the Hedgehog is a side-scrolling platformer where 
you play as Sonic, a fast-moving blue hedgehog that's trying to free the animal inhabitants of South Island from the experiments of the mad scientist Dr. Evo Robotnik. And yes, I'm calling him Dr. Robotnik and not Dr. Eggman, because that's what Sega of America named him, and frankly, Dr. Eggman is just a really dumb name. So, just how great a game is Sonic the Hedgehog? Does it hold up after all these years? Will it be the first game to get the fabled 5-star rating on this channel? And should you watch the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, if only for no reason other than Jim Carrey's comedic stylings? Well, one of those questions we're going to answer right now, yes, you absolutely should watch the Sonic the Hedgehog movie as soon as possible, as it's a legitimately good movie. But for the rest, we'll tackle those after our customary look at the package. And here is my copy of Sonic the Hedgehog. And you can immediately see on the cover that this is what I believe is the more common version of the game, the not-for-resale version, which was the pack-in with the Genesis console. The game was also initially sold by itself, and then later was part of the Sega Classic line. This is not my original copy of the game, as any games that I had from the 90s are unfortunately long since gone. This just happens to be the copy that I picked up probably four years ago, early on when I started building this collection. This copy has definitely seen some wear, and it's what I would classify as well-loved. As you can see, many surface scratches and a few divots on the outer cover when you hold it up to the light. However, I would also say that this copy is an example of the genius of the plastic clamshell cover, as even with all that wear and tear, the inner cover is pristine, with no water damage or sun bleaching. Oh, and on a unique note, notice up at the top there's no hang tab, but it hasn't been removed, this copy just simply never had a hang tab, as it was a pack and release, so there was no reason for one. Sometimes at this point, I compare the cover that we got in the United States with others, and I think that's appropriate here, as the art for the European and Japanese releases was decidedly different from what we got in the United States. I've got to say, I really think the American cover is the definitive one, I just think that it's the best looking of the bunch, as the European cover is frankly boring, even though I prefer that open format, and the Japanese cover is just noisy. Although when looking at this comparison, I did find something interesting. Look at the bottom on the Japanese cover. Don't just sit there and waste your precious time. When you want to do something, do it right away. Do it when you can. It's the only way to live a life without regrets. Well. Tomorrow line from Jim. Alrighty then. Flipping over to the back, and this is a pretty great rear cover. I really can't complain about much here. Three good quality screenshots, including one off-kilter one due to Sonic running through the image. Probably could have included one from outside the first two zones, but that's being really picky. All the flavor text is good at hyping up the game, and I especially like the shade at Super Mario Bros. at the bottom with a closing line. Sonic may be the world's next super hero. Indeed, Sega. Opening up the box, and this cartridge has definitely seen some wear if you look at it from the top. It's been pulled out of a console more than a few times. Also, this not for resale is not a sticker on top of an existing label like they did for other games. It's actually embedded into the image. The manual is held up well, and really with just some bending at the top corner. Flipping over the back, and there's a nice ad for Castle of Illusion, a series that I haven't hit yet, but it's definitely coming. The manual itself is very nice, as Sega's first party manuals usually are, with tons of screenshots from the game, and then even some nice illustrations of the various enemies in the game. This is how to do a manual, even if it's a relatively simple game like Sonic the Hedgehog is. Okay, that's the package. Let's get to the game and have some fun. As mentioned earlier, Sonic the Hedgehog is a platformer, originally released for the Sega Genesis on June 23, 1991, before follow-up releases for the Mega Drive in Japan and Europe the next month. I'm not mentioning the Master System or Game Gear versions here, because while Sonic had releases on those two platforms as well, they're not true ports, with decidedly different level layouts and zones. It will be, however, interesting to compare the Master System version and the Genesis version, which I'll be doing in the big 200th episode in a few years, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Until the summer of 1991, the Genesis had been doing well against the aging NES, 
not to mention the TurboGrafx-16, mainly on the strength of its arcade port library. Sega really benefited from the similarity of their System 16 arcade hardware in creating ports, and when they couldn't get a developer slash publisher to create games for their console due to existing agreements with Nintendo, they went out and licensed those titles from said publisher and made their own versions, a la Capcom with Ghouls and Ghosts and Strider. However, a console library is not made from arcade ports alone, and Sega needed a game to really fill that hole with a title that could be played by young and old alike. As big a market as the arcade crowd is, there were still tons of kids out there that would be better served by a title that could provide excitement and action for all ages. Also, let's face it, a console by itself is just a cold, unfeeling piece of plastic and silicon. What game companies figured out from the example of Nintendo and Mario was, to sell consoles, they needed a friendly face, or a mascot as it were, to drive the console and give even the casual observer a reference point to the company and the piece of hardware they were trying to sell. Mario, with the obscene success of Super Mario Bros., had become synonymous with the NES. Sega had attempted this as well with the Master System and made Alex Kidd and his fist the face of the console. However, there was just one big difference. Regardless of your opinion on the Master System versus the NES, Alex Kidd just didn't resonate with people in the same way, and that could be argued for numerous reasons. One of those reasons is simplicity. The original Super Mario Bros. works largely because it's a simple game to play. For the majority of the game, Super Mario Bros. has you pressing three buttons. Left, right, or jump. Yes, there's fireball spitting and running with the other button, but just to start playing the game, all you needed to know were right, left, and jump. This, this simplicity allowed the game to be enjoyed by kids, as young as kindergartners, to their parents who were solidly in the middle age. Sonic the Hedgehog succeeded massively for Sega for a number of reasons that I'll get into in a minute, but the most crucial aspect to me about the game is just how easy to play it is. And I don't mean the game is easy necessarily, there's definitely skill involved to make your way through the entire game, but just the ability to pick up and play the game with minimal instruction is quietly more important than any other factor, whether it be marketing, blast processing, or anything else. Going back to the analogy of Super Mario Bros., when playing Sonic the Hedgehog, you're only concerned with those same three buttons, left, right, and jump. And Sonic, as part of his nature, is already fast, so there's no reason to have to worry about holding down a second button to run fast, it just happens automatically. Are you more comfortable using the B or C button to jump instead of the A button? Well, you're in luck, because they all do the same thing! Hell, if you want, you can plug an Atari 2600 joystick into your Genesis to play Sonic the Hedgehog due to its simplicity. Although, I wouldn't recommend it. Yes, there are times when you'll want to press down to cause Sonic to go into ball mode, but again, to just to pick up and play the game, very few titles by the 16-bit era were simpler to explain. And just to contrast Sonic with the upcoming Super Mario World, Super Mario World is a much more complicated game that worked because it had an already built-in audience that had been built up from the previous three titles. Even going back to the game all these years later, as I did with this week's video, there was no need to re-acclimate myself with the title. It was simply a matter of putting the cartridge in, pressing start, and I was off to the races. No pun intended. Also, I suppose I should mention that even if the game was simple, it still needed to control well, and be responsive to button presses, especially with the speed certain points of the game achieves. And I can honestly say that the controls are perfectly dialed in, and if you take a hit or lose your rings, or worse, die accidentally, that's on you. There's no unfairness or lag here, which is good because there's definitely some times when landing jumps with precision is key. When talking about Sonic, one of the things you have to discuss is the speed at which the game moves. Sega created an entire blast processing ad campaign blitz around the success of Sonic the Hedgehog. And while yes, there's definitely some, well, stretching the truth about the capabilities of the Genesis versus the other consoles of the time, Sonic does take advantage of the faster clock speed and wider bit path of the Motorola 68000 versus say the Ricoh 5A22 at the heart of the Super Nintendo. 
and there's just certain things it's better at. However, as impressive as Sonic the Hedgehog is when it really gets moving on screen, it's not just a matter of gotta go fast. And when the action Sonic slows down, it's just as good. Also, in an understated element, Sonic has what I would consider a solid physics engine. For example, to get Sonic up to speed on his own, it takes a few steps to build momentum, which makes the player have to make decisions about being careful in certain areas and slowing down, versus just blasting through to keep things moving and be able to make certain jumps. One of the things that I think Sega got nearly perfect with, if not perfect, in Sonic is the length of the game. Sonic the Hedgehog is made up of six zones with three levels each, and then a final zone where it's just you versus Robotnik one-on-one. -on -one. Usually in the third level of each zone you'll face off against Robotnik in some sort of contraption, giving the game a decent amount of mini-bosses to mix things up. In my game, last night to record footage for the video, I beat the entire game in a run of just short of two hours, playing at a leisurely pace. For a game without the ability to save and then continue later, I think this is a great length and allows you to have fun without having to dedicate an entire weekend to playing a game. When you start getting over two hours in game time as just a base requirement, I think that's when things tend to get too long. For instance, in Toe Jam & Earl back in episode 95, a full session of that game will run you between three and three and a half hours. And it definitely feels it the further you get into it. And again, I want to be clear here, I have nothing against long games. I put about 250 hours into Skyrim when I played through it a few years ago. But that two hour length without a save game just seems like the sweet spot of not too short and not too long. Another thing that I really liked about what Sega did with Sonic comes down to difficulty. I mentioned earlier that it does require a bit of skill, and it does. An average player will cruise through Green Hill, Marble, and Spring Yard zones with no problem, but by the time you reach the Labyrinth zone, things ramp up a bit and you'll start to have to be a bit more careful. But once you get the game mechanics down and learn how each of the Robotnik mini-bosses work, beating the game should be old hat for most players. But, what if playing Sonic wasn't just about simply completing all the levels and beating all the bosses? Sega, in a bit of genius, added the Chaos Emeralds to the game. And to truly beat the game and get the good ending, you have to collect all six Chaos Emeralds from rotating pinball-esque bonus stages on the way through the game. This adds another bit of difficulty for seasoned players, and really gives the players an incentive to play the levels well rather than sloppily cross the finish line with just a few rings. Having this extra bit of challenge definitely expands replayability of the game, as seeing Robotnik taunt you at the end of the game with the emeralds that you didn't collect makes you want to get right back in and try again. I mentioned before the speed of the graphics in the game are one of its calling cards, and it is, but this isn't just a game that can display graphics on the screen quickly. The graphics themselves are very nice, with each of the zones having a very different theme and color scheme. None of the zones seem drab or boring, with each one being very colorful, especially given the console's 64 on-screen color limit. Along with all the colors, there's also something going on, either with parallax scrolling in the background, or extra animations in the foreground, with specifically some great water and fire special effects. It's not the best looking game on the console, but by mid-91 standards, it's pretty fantastic. The in-game sound is great as well, and seems like it got just as much attention as the graphics did. Which is good, because as I've mentioned before, sometimes in display-heavy games, the audio ends up being a bit of an afterthought. But I can safely say that that is not the case here. Each of the zones has a different soundtrack, and Robotnik has his own themes as well when he shows up. The soundtrack fits the zones well, and you can tell there was a lot of thought involved into what kind of music would suit each of the zones. The sound effects in game are great as well. Everything is clear as a bell, and the sound effects perfectly match the action on screen. There's a reason why to this day lottery ticket machines and convenience scores often have either the Mario coin or Sonic ring noise attached to them. In a long list of impressive things about Sonic the Hedgehog, one that probably goes unmentioned most of the time is its size. I just stated how the game has a particularly impressive graphics and sound for its time period. So, you'd probably think that it's at least an 8 megabit game, right? Like other impressive titles from the era. 
Nope. Try half that. That's right, the original Sonic the Hedgehog for Genesis is only a 4 megabit game. I was astounded by that when doing research for the game, as I had no idea, and frankly, I don't know how they pulled it off. I know there's a lot of repeated textures and such, but still, to have graphics and sound as good as they are and cram it into 4 megabits is just ridiculous. All in all, I'm giving Sonic the Hedgehog for Genesis 4 stars. I know there's some that would argue that it's a 5 star game, and if you're one of those, by all means. It is an all-timer of a game, and should go into whatever video game hall of fame exists. But for me, I'm reserving that 5 star rating for truly the best of the best. A game where I'm hard pressed to come up with any flaws about it whatsoever. And to me, I think the one knock on the game has to be that it's a little too simple. It did its job and put Sega on the map with all types of players, but ultimately I need a little more besides just running and jumping for me to consider it a perfect game. Despite that though, like all the other games that I've given 4 stars to, this is a game that if you have any interest in the 16-bit era at all, that you owe it yourself to experience at least once. You'll be glad you did. Well that was Sonic the Hedgehog, and I can honestly say that I've been looking forward to this review for a while now. Not just because it was my 100th review, but because I knew this was going to be one of the better games I was going to play during the run of this channel. Now, you might be thinking, well Dave, if Sonic the Hedgehog didn't get a 5 star rating, what will? Do you need to adjust your scale? And to that I'd say, don't worry, there are definitely some games in the library that I already know are 5 star releases, we've just got to get to them first. And it's not like Sonic the Hedgehog didn't have any sequels. Tune in next week when I stay on the Genesis and we start the run-up to episode 200. For those of you that are familiar with the channel's history, you may remember that the first game I ever reviewed was Pro Wrestling for the Master System. Pro Wrestling didn't get a sequel, but I think in honor of this past weekend's Royal Rumble, it will be time for another Pro Wrestling game. As a result, there's a very good chance that the recent string of good games is over, but who knows, maybe I'll be surprised. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video, and remember, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!